So I just would like to wel welcome everyone and thank you for making the time to attend um, this meeting tonight. I would like to introduce to you Theodora Scarato, who is, has been generous to donate her time to give us a little bit of information, um, provide a little background education on the impact of wireless technology, particular cell, to cell towers on, on health. And um, obviously we're very interested in the impact on children's health as well. So that will be the focus of her um, information. And then um, after she presents her information, we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. Uh, Theodora Scarato is executive director of Environmental Health Trust, a scientific think tank that publishes research and educates policy policymakers. Hundreds of scientists are recommending the public that the public reduce exposure to wireless radiation of cell phones and cell towers. Scarato has published several research papers, including a paper on reducing EMF exposures in buildings, co-authored with experts including Frank Clegg, former Microsoft Canada president, and a review paper on health effects to children with U.S. experts entitled Wireless Technologies Non-Ionizing Electromagnetic Fields in Children, Identifying and Reducing Health Risks, published in Current Problems in Pediatric and Adolescent Healthcare. EHT, Environmental Health Trust, filed a historic lawsuit, EHT uh, et al. versus the FCC against the FCC regarding their wireless radiation safety limits and won a favorable, favorable decision whereby the FCC has been mandated to re-examine the record evidence on wireless radiation. And with that, I um, introduce to you Theodora Sc Scarato. Thank you for joining us tonight, Theodora. I got involved in this as a social worker. I worked in schools, uh, directed intensive therapy programs in schools and worked with kids who had a lot of issues. Uh, and when I started learning, like what got sparked me on this, in addition to having my own young children at the time or younger, was that when I read about damage to the brain and impacts uh, to, you know, cognition and memory, that really just got me reading because I had thought that, of course, this technology is perfectly safe. If we can buy it, it should be safe. How could it be marketed if it weren't? And I read and read, and really, I was so skeptical, I must tell you. And I came out on the other side and went, wait a minute. I was like, there are all these studies. Something's going on here. And then I got involved, and that was a decade ago. Um, this is a tower right near me, uh, near uh, a high school near me, where we have the cell tower really close to the school. And in many countries, this would be illegal because they do not allow cell towers near schools or they have more restrictive levels that are allowed near schools. And just to start off with what we're talking about here, this is in Detroit, where there are many schools with cell towers and communities are organizing there on this issue. People should be alarmed that there are cell towers above their children's heads every day. Carla Mitchell is the mother of an eighth grader at Paul Robeson Malcolm X Academy. It's one of 24 schools in Detroit with a cell phone tower on the property. Mitchell was among many parents who are growing concerned about the potential dangers the towers pose to their children. It's not just a district issue. It's a public health issue. Recently, Detroit City Council voted unanimously on a resolution calling on the health department to do a study to determine the impact the cell towers have on students. Councilwoman Mary Waters says it's important to know if children are at risk. We should be willing to spend whatever it takes to make sure that it's not affecting our babies. In 2017, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended the government to tighten wireless exposure limits based on studies, specifically this one from Egypt, that found people living near mobile phone based stations had an increased risk of negative health effects. I stand on the playground. You can see the T-Mobile antenna installed on the chimney of Washington Elementary School in Wyandotte. Parents, we've told you, have been protesting that antenna, concerned about the safety. We have all of our federal permits, all of our state permits, all of our local permits, and a valid contract that allows that cell site to operate safely. Michelle Sanders, a director of lease and site optimization for T-Mobile, appeared with a contractor who planned the antennas at a recent school board meeting. 
They said the antennas comply with FCC safety regulations. And as I said, the theoretical modeling showed that the exposure levels on the rooftop are well below those limits. Radio frequency from the cellular tower is harmful to people. Wayne State Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering Dr. John Liu has studied digital communications for more than 40 years. He says studies show there is a risk. In 2016, the U.S. National Toxicology Program released findings showing rats developed tumors after exposure to such radiation. The American Cancer Society has called for more research. It pointed out the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified RF radiation emitted by such antennas as, quote, possibly carcinogenic to humans. At the same time, the FCC has said such antennas result in RF emission exposure far below safety limits. Professor Liu asks, without conclusive evidence it's safe, is it ethical to put an antenna on a school? Somebody puts a tower on an elementary school chimney. What do you think that is? Other than greed. They just want to save money. So just confess. They're doing evil. Just stop doing it. And we'll continue to deploy sites on schools because we are operating in full compliance with FCC regulations. Around the world, there are groups and organizations working on this issue. And I'm going to start off with the former Microsoft Canada president, Frank Clegg, who's on our board of Environmental Health Trust, as well as Dr. Anthony Miller. I've spent over 40 years in the technology industry. My most recent position was president of Microsoft Canada. And I've seen the tremendous benefit technology can provide. I've also seen the potential harm the technology is not used correctly. In my opinion, our current implementation of wireless technology is not safe. I've met with experts from institutions such as Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and the University of Toronto. And I've met with an expert advisor to the World Health Organization and one of the lead scientific writers for Al Gore's team that won the Nobel Prize. Over 250 scientists from 40 countries signed a formal appeal to the World Health Organization and the United Nations member states expressing their concern over the harmful effects of wireless technology and added an additional appeal for the effects of 5G, especially the effects on children. Hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers have been published demonstrating harm to humans and the environment. This evidence includes increase in cancer, sperm damage, reproductive harms, memory and learning deficits, especially in children, and damage to our DNA, nervous systems, and the cells in our bodies. The combined evidence, in my view, is that there is now sufficient evidence that radio frequency radiation is carcinogenic to humans. That's IR category one, and you can't ignore that. And the implications of this, we have to be cautious. Radio frequency radiation is now ubiquitous. We're probably exposed to it in this room, even though we do not want to be. And we know that although the risk per individual is low, the radiation is widely distributed. I was astounded when I went up one of your peaks to find a cell tower at the top of the tram. My goodness, what are they doing to people? And when we continue doing this, this could result in major public health problems. So that was a video from uh, 2017, when we had a conference bringing together experts and Dr. Miller was there presenting on their new determination at that time that the science clearly indicated that uh, wireless radiation was a human carcinogen. The WHO classified it, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, back in 2011 as a possible carcinogen. Um, and there are now many members of the World Health Organization, International Agency for the Research on Cancer, uh, who were part of that group uh, now almost a decade ago, well, over a decade ago, who now say that it is uh, either a probable or proven carcinogen. And once you get to 
uh, the probable category, that's actually when laws change, especially in Europe or in countries where they uh, act protectively and with uh, before, you know, you have all of these statistics of people injured. Because one of the ways that things work uh, in the world, unfortunately, is that we have sometimes countries wait until there are these statistics, but the statistics are people. And why wait? Why not take action now? So when I got involved way back before I understood any of the science and I wasn't working with Environmental Health Trust, I just had read like literally hundreds of studies. I said, you know, I take precaution. That's sort of like what moms do or dads and how we are with our kids. And that uh, was sort of where my mind was. Now many scientists would say that we work with, this isn't about precaution anymore. It's about caution because we know, we know enough to know what to do. Now, there are many communities, and I have a list here, where they have setbacks for wireless antennas from schools, be they the tall towers, like you see there, be they the shorter small cells, um, and there are setbacks of from 250 to 1,500 feet, or preferred placement, where, because uh, depending on where you live, there might be a laws that stop you from being able to have actual setbacks and you need to have preferred placements or look here first, like before you put it near a school, before you put it near a home, put it farther away as a more responsible uh, position. And if you look at our limit of what we're allowed to be exposed to in the United States compared to many other countries, you can see that we are uh, we allow, if you look over here, you have the US, Japan, and actually uh, several other countries have a very high level of what is allowed. Like how much can we be exposed to of cell tower radiation? What's floating around in the air? And oops, let me just unplug this, I'm sorry. And many countries like Switzerland, Italy, Russia, China, India actually have much more, and actually several European countries have more restrictive limits, uh, 10 to 100 times more restrictive than the United States. So a lot of times when a cell tower is proposed, the company will say, look, it's just 1% of what FCC allows. This is so low, or even 0.05%. But actually, those levels would not be allowed, depending on the frequency, in some countries or would be like at the top of their level of what's allowed. Uh, so this is because uh, in the United States, we have limits that are from 1996 and haven't changed since. And they're actually based on uh, studies that are from pre-1983. Uh, and they're not even based on long-term exposure, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So, and also to put some perspective in terms of what other communities are doing, the, uh, the Los Angeles, California Public School District, several years ago, actually, they came out with their recommended limits. Well, first of all, they banned cell towers near schools, on schools, and they also have a resolution about near schools in addition to on the school property. But they also recommended a threshold 10,000 times lower than the FCC standard. And they state it is believed a more conservative level is necessary to protect children who represent a potentially vulnerable and sensitive population. So that's some perspective. So when we hear, don't worry, that cell tower, the, Radiation is 1% or 0.5%. It's like, that doesn't compare to where, where um, experts, and, and that was based on, on studies, and many experts have said the, there could be harmful effects. So our standards are from 1996. They were not designed to address or protect against biological impacts. They weren't designed to protect against effects after long-term exposure, like cancer impacts to the brain, um, neurological impacts, reproductive impacts, or impacts to the immune system. They certainly did not include any data on current technology because it didn't exist in 1996 for them to know. I mean, and here we are 
many, nearly 30 years later, and we have the same limits that were set way back. They also didn't have any understanding at that time of children's vulnerability to this radiation. So the FCC a few years ago in 2019, they said that they didn't need to change these limits, that they looked at, they had this big record before them, they'd asked the question, should we change them? And they made a decision, no, we don't need to change them. And that's when we filed a lawsuit against the FCC because stating that they had not adequately looked at the, the record, the full record before them. And we got a favorable decision in that, and we had uh, over 10,000 pages of evidence that we'd submitted. It was the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Uh, they ruled that the FCC's decision not to update its limits was arbitrary and capricious because they had ignored in their decision, they hadn't showed proper review of everything that they had been sent. Specifically, they had ignored the issue of long-term exposure, of children's vulnerability, people who'd been injured. There were over 200 uh, statements and testimonies by people talking about how they had, or their family members had been injured by um, wireless radiation. There was a woman whose son uh, was in the California college. It was up on the top floor and there was a cell tower. So it was a line of sight to the tower and he developed brain tumor. And then actually more people who were in that area who were working there also developed cancer. And they actually ended up shutting down the entire top floor of that building because of that. Not admitting that it was the cell tower, but they did stop people from working there. So also they'd ignored impacts to the developing brain, reproduction, and a complete failure to address environmental effects, which I'm not going to focus on, but is a really important issue, which is impacts to birds, bees, trees, wildlife. Glad to share more about that another time. Just to tell you a few of the school boards and communities that have restrictions, in addition to Los Angeles, is the Palo Alto, California Unified School District. They have a resolution on a setback for towers in Oregon, uh, Vancouver School Board, Greenbelt, Maryland, where I lived. They actually ended up having a resolution against cell towers on schools. And that was after something similar to, I think, what's happening in your community, where a developer had gotten all of the schools in the county to be potential cell tower sites that they could market. And thankfully, there was a city council member who actually took all the elementary schools off at some point after people found out about it. But then we had the middle and high schools. A lot happened. I can talk about that later. But what ended up happening was uh, when parents really understood what was happening and that their voices weren't being heard and that there wasn't a lot of transparency in the process, they ended up stopping the uh, relationship between the developer and the, the, the county. It ended and they did not renew it and actually issued letters about the lack of transparency. I can talk a little about the science and I'm gonna not talk too much because I could talk like, you know, for the next few hours about it, but just to give you some summary of some of the studies. The American Academy of Pediatrics, if you go to their page on electromagnetic fields, they talk about, um, this was a, this is uh, from their website, I just put a clip about an Egyptian study that confirmed concerns that living nearby mobile phone base stations increase the risk for developing headaches, memory problems, dizziness, depression, sleep problems. And they talk about the need for larger studies um, but that these associations have been found. And this page was put up several years ago, and there have been many studies since then. So because of that, um, actually, I'll go here. Um, this study is called Limiting Liability to Minimize the Negative Effects of Cell Towers. And um, the, the author looked at a lot of these studies that find 
Like that Egyptian study was what might be called radio frequency sickness, dizziness, brain fog, um, a series of symptoms that people um, are reporting when they get cell towers close to them. People call us all the time. They have gotten a cell tower up literally in front of the bedroom windows in their homes, and they start developing these various ailments. Um, and this paper looked at all of that, and it's actually written for the companies. And it says to minimize your future liability, these cell towers need to be at 500 feet away from homes, schools, and hospitals to protect the liability, you know, your company or your institution. This is a review that was just done uh, last year um, by Alfonso Balmori on studies that looked at people living near cell towers. And he found that uh, the majority of them showed effects. And the three buckets of effects they found were radio frequency sickness, 73% um, of the studies, and that would be the headaches, dizziness, sleep problems, cognitive issues, uh, cancer. And this was looking at a lot of studies um, and as well changes in biochemical parameters. And he concludes most of the studies carried out by research groups from 20 different countries reach the same conclusion. Here's an example of one where they looked at uh, people living near cell towers and far away, cell, far away from cell towers, and they tested their blood. They also did a lot of controlling around, they took measurements in the people's bedrooms and they found changes in the blood, which are actually indicative of um, potentially future cancer. And then there's the European Parliament, which came out with a 2021 report looking at 5G. Now, 5G is going to be all the frequencies we have in use now and actually higher frequencies. I don't know what your particular towers will have, but what I do know is that uh, whatever there is can change. And once it goes up, whenever a tower goes up, the changing out the antennas happens generally with that, with very little community input. So you might have a certain set of frequencies that goes in. And then once that's allowed to get the changes in the equipment, generally they just apply and get it done. There's no like community meeting. So the conclusion of the European Parliament on the frequencies that we have now, the low uh, range, um, low bands that are commonly in use for radio frequencies, were that they're probably carcinogenic for humans. And this was a study service um, review of studies. And they also looked at effects related to reproduction and fertility and the development, you know, prenatal exposure, the development of embryos, fetuses, and newborns. This is Kent Chamberlain. I was going to play a little video of him talking. He is the past chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of New Hampshire. And he also was on the New York State Commission on 5G Health Effects, which looked at this issue and recommended a setback of uh, over 1,000 feet, 1,600 feet for cell towers from schools and homes. The commission met for a year studying this issue and then came up with uh, over a dozen recommendations. And that was one of them uh, related to this issue of wireless radiation. Frankly, I got to say that when we started this study, we started, when I was asked to join the commission, I didn't think there was any harm from low level wireless radiation. I was told maybe you shouldn't have your phone right next to your head, but besides that, the conventional wisdom in our discipline was that this low-level radiation was pretty much harmless. So that was the long-held conventional wisdom. Exposure. So I would like to summarize the last two bullets on this slide, and the first is that there are many publications in high-quality journals that show harm from wireless radiation exposure. The second is that such publications are not in the minority. They are in the majority. We're moving along uh, and talking about the uh, major uh, harm causing effects of wireless radiation, and that is oxidative stress. So I'll say a few words about it. 
That stress can lead to the creation of free radicals, and I'm assuming most of you have heard about free radicals. Studies show that cell mitochondria are affected by even low-level radiation exposure, and that causes free radicals to form during the production of ATP. Don't mean to get too nerdy on you, but I wanted to show that there is a known mechanism for causing problems. Um, uh, the, you may know that free radicals lead to chronic illnesses, such as the one shown on the slide, such as Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. And you know that these, these illnesses have increased significantly since the rollout of wireless communications in the United States. Now, I'll be saying more about that later, but I've put in hyperlinks to the diseases so you can look at some of the peer-reviewed articles and the ones that describe the association between those diseases and wireless radiation exposure. There are thousands of articles, and we looked at hundreds of them in the commission, but I'm only able to link, do a little bit of linking on the slide here. Uh, if you want to know more about some of this, I uh, have uh, a, a listing of uh, 38 epidemiological studies that show what happens to people who live near cell towers. And the vast majority of those studies show for adverse health effect, effects you don't want to live near a cell tower. And the second link, which I'd recommend, describes the rationale used by the New Hampshire Commission to come up with that 500 meter setback. We did it a couple of different ways, but we came up with a strong rationale for why you should set back new towers. There are experts all across the country and world who are working on this. And if you want to hear more from Kent Chamberlain or Frank Clegg or any of the other experts, you can go to our YouTube channel at Environmental Health Trust because that's from a talk uh, that he presented and that's online. All of these are online to watch. The commission report is online. 23 years ago, T-Mobile commissioned a report on this issue. And the authors recommended an exposure limit a thousand times lower than FCC's limit. And that was uh, a long time ago before we even have all the studies that we have now. I know scientifically that putting up these cell phones, cell phone towers is safe. But the International Association of Firefighters disagrees. They began opposing cell towers on fire stations after firefighters complained of health problems. These firefighters developed symptoms. Dr. Gunnar Heuser conducted a pilot study on firefighters at a station with cell towers. And the symptoms included problem with memory, problem with intermittent confusion, problem with weakness. Heuser says their brain scans suggest even low-level RF can cause cell damage. And he worries about more vulnerable groups like kids. So we found abnormal brain function in all of the firefighters we examined. So, following lobbying by firefighters, Cork and his co-author exempted fire stations from their bill, making them one place cell companies couldn't put a tower. This is the first piece of legislation that I think anyone's aware of where somebody got an exemption because they were concerned about health. Did they tell you at all about the all study? All I know is that when the firefighters ask, you know, I do what they ask me to do. Because they're strong lobbyists? Yes. So if, say, school teachers and parents had a strong lobby and they asked you to pass something that would prevent these from going up in your schools, would you do that? If I couldn't get the votes any other way. Firefighter and cancer survivor Tony Stefani notes... It's not only firefighters, it's the people that live in the general vicinity, vicinity of these towers. Current regulations don't take into account continuous low-level exposure from these small cells 24 hours a day. This is an example of a cell tower going up in New York City. These are these big, gigantic towers, and there are many community boards opposed to these uh, facilities going up because they're literally 10 feet from home. So you've got your window and you've got this 10 feet away. And this, by the way, is a picture from uh, when I was in San Francisco and I looked out my window, I have a meter, I can measure the radiation. And I looked outside and I, because my meter was so high and here it was, this cell antenna right outside. There is no compliant or enforcement program for cell towers, for, uh, for 5G, for 4G, for big towers uh, in the United States. In many other countries, they are measuring and monitoring what the levels are. They're checking that what the companies say is what 
the is actually happening on the ground, uh, but there are not any kind of programs like that in the US. So if you lived in France and you wanted to know what's the radiation level outside my home right now, you wonder, that's like a good question. Like I, I want to know, right? You'd go to your mayor and the mayor would actually either say, oh, we did that reading. Let me give it to you. Or they would order a reading and you would get that reading and know what it was. But in the US, we don't have any such transparency programs. We, uh, it's complete, it, it's like virtually unregulated in terms of the biological effects. We don't have monitoring or measuring or any of that. Um, in fact, we operate on the honor system. So in the US, uh, we ask the companies if is there compliance? And the companies say, well, yes, it is. And we have our consultants who we use all the time who are showing you that it's compliant. And there's no checking of that. There's no review. There's no, um, I, I, look, I have seen a lot of RF compliance reports by companies. They are all different. There's no standardized way that we even get them. So there's so many standardized everything, right? Like everything we do, we have to fill out the form. We have to do it this way. We have to make sure it's that way. When I worked in a school, we had to like make sure everything was according to these rules. But when it comes to cell towers, we just sort of do, people do it all different ways. And it's quite impressive the different ways people do it. And we're working with actually whistleblowers right now who are documenting how egregious this is because the levels being put forward are not necessarily accurate. The um, way that measurements are being done are inadequate. And uh, we need to do a better job on this. This is unacceptable. So, and just as a comparison in many other countries, France, Switzerland, um, even in India, where my gosh, they found 300 towers to be non-compliant because they do checking. They check a certain percentage of all their facilities every a year to make sure that they are actually what the companies say. But in the US, we don't do that at all. So I, when I was 10 years ago, I thought, oh, come on now. I'm sure the FDA or the EPA or all these federal agencies, they're on this like a hot cake. Let me find out what they have to say. And I found when I contacted them that there were no answers. Uh, they didn't have answers. And this is a quote from a recent letter, uh, actually to a mother, not me, who had an antenna outside her home where uh, the FDA clarified they do not regulate cell towers. They have no studies or information on cell towers in response to her questions. And, um, they just don't. The National Cancer Institute has not done a research review to make a determination. They've done no evaluation of FCC limits. They specifically say what's on our website is not a research uh, evaluation and it doesn't, it's not applicable to the levels. So, and it actually isn't applicable to towers at all. And when I wrote the EPA, and I've had many, many letters back and forth with the EPA, but these were part of our lawsuit actually. And I said, well, are you studying this or you know, what's, what's the deal with, well, I didn't say it like that, but I said, what studies have you done on children? What have you done on immune system? What have you done on reproductive, et cetera? And they said that their last review was in 1984 and they don't have a mandate on it and they haven't done any research on it and they don't have any funded activities. And sort of the, the story is that once upon a time, the EPA was working on this issue and then they were defunded. And there has been no work on this issue uh, in the United States, except for an NIH study that found cancer since the defunding of the EPA. We, it was defunded, the EPA was setting limits and they were literally defunded from setting limits so we have no systematic review of all of the science. We don't have any risk or hazard assessment for health effects, which you would think we would do is look at all the studies and say, what's the risk for these various endpoints? And not just cancer, uh, impacts to the immune system, reproduction, 
um, you know, impacts to the brain development and so forth. But that has not happened, not by any U.S. regulatory agency with health, environment, or safety expertise. That's not the EPA, FDA, CDC, WHO as well, or the American Cancer Society. So that's sort of where we are. And we have hundreds of scientists. This is a quote from the EMF scientists. You already heard uh, Frank talk about that. Talk about the effects documented in studies. Uh, and yet there's been no action in the US. So here are communities with a tower going up and people are being asked to have these placed in front of them. And yet there's not been adequate uh, research on safety in the studies that we do have, the majority of them show effects. And how did we get here? If you're interested in kind of a primer, be it a decade old at this point, read the Harvard report, Captured Agency by Norm Alster. This was a Harvard investigation that found the wireless companies are using the same playbook as Big Tobacco. The FCC is a captured agency. After all, the heads are often former industry CEOs or lobbyists who now were placed on the FCC or when they leave the FCC, they then go back into industry. So there's this revolving door between industry and government. And, it, and they conclude the wireless industry is using the um, tobacco industry playbook. And they fund a lot of studies. They fund scientists and studies. And those studies more often show no harm. So if you want to learn more, please go to our website at Environmental Health Trust. I have my email. If you want to contact me, please sign up for our newsletter. We are working on this issue at the federal level, and we also educate at the community level. And we have a lot of resources, and I'm glad to answer questions. Thank you, Theodora. That was amazing. Um, I have a question to kick us off. So um, one of the questions I have, um, Theodora, was off of uh, one of the slides that you had where I saw House Bill 1644, which would require a setback, I presume, of 500 meters or, you know, hmm. 60 feet. Do you know the status of that bill currently? Yeah, that was in New Hampshire. So what happened was after the New Hampshire Commission came out with that recommendation, among other recommendation, that bill was put forward. And that ended up, what well, actually it was really good news. Like first it was proposed, then the um, legislators said, well, you know, we don't know enough about this. We, we need to understand more. They sent it to a study group. The study group actually passed it back out. I testified to that, many experts testified. And they said, you know, this, this does merit our attention. This is important. We want more legislation like that. It got back, but it didn't make it in time because you know how the process goes to actually be put through. That would have been for the entire state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that is um, something that you'll, we'll see more of, um, you know, coming in the future? you know, that led state legislatures might actually take action on these things. Uh, you know, it seems like people don't know or aren't aware of the health effects. So do you see that as something that might be coming in the future? I actually do. I think the challenge is that some states have federal, pre have um, state laws that don't allow that, but other states, there is the ability to do that. And there's been more and more, just so you know, other, other bills. So we have, um, in Maine, there was a bill that's still in flux right now on wildlife and studying impacts related to wildlife and to children. And then we have another uh, set of bills in Massachusetts. I would just like to present LD697, which tasks the University of Maine with investigating the effects of so-called 5G technology on bird, bee, and insect populations and long-term effects on children. My young adult children and many constituents brought this issue to my attention when they learned that there are questions of biological harm from today's wireless technology. When I looked into it, I discovered that the state of Maine has no science-based technology safety information, <clears throat> excuse me, to provide to the public. As some of you are aware, I've been a registered nurse for 25 years. So I looked for the science and I was surprised by what I did not know. Um, so that's something that um, when we're in the nursing field, we always look for scientific information. And I was surprised truly that our state did not have this available. When I went to find this information from our state, I had to look to other states 
uh, for leadership in this category. And so um, that was rather disappointing to me. And so I would like our state to take the lead. That's what this bill is about. There's a um, question in the chat um, that is, is there a recommended device to purchase and use for home exposure to radiation? Hmm. I do, we do recommend getting a meter because it helps you know what, what's going on. And maybe you wanna remediate some things in your home and reduce your exposures then you can verify that you are. You can also go outside and measure what the levels are. So I, um, we, we have a Safe and Sound Pro 2 from Safe Living Technology that, that um, we use. It's a higher level, it's, it's a consumer grade. It's not a, the $1,000 meters that you know radio frequency engineers use. It, it's not that. But it does give you where it's higher and lower, much better than some of the cheaper ones. And I would say this, we have a program that you may be interested in, where if you can get your library, we have libraries, several libraries are getting these because they cost maybe three or $400. And then you, the community can share it and we will actually help out. I have another um, follow-up question um, about liability. So um, uh, you, you had mentioned that um, that there's who would be liable if um, if there were to be you know like the, like in the brain cancer instance where you talked about you know the people on the top floor who had a mm -hmm. close exposure to the tower who's liable for that is that something the school district could potentially be liable for I'm so glad you raised this so first let me say insurance companies they classify this radiation as high risk they because they they even compare it to asbestos because of the long latency in which you can see effects. And so uh, they do not insure companies for the health damages from their products. Wireless companies cannot get insurance to cover if people started suing. They, they said, we're not too high risk. That says a lot there. What I always say is if, if that's too high for the shareholders, you know, like if that's, if the insurance companies won't cover it why are we? Because who's going to bear the cost? So then is the question, does the school system have insurance that covers this? It is considered a pollutant. It's defined as a pollutant in most um, policies, not all, but most. Um, and so you need to find that out. And something that communities have done is actually specifically ask if there are injuries, health damages from wireless radiation, uh, is the school, whoever those groups that would be sued, are they covered? And we find uh, that in many communities, they are not covered by the insurance. The companies warn their shareholders in their tax filing that there could be future lawsuits, that they could lose, there could, they could laws could change and they could be have to pay out financially and that that would impact the shareholders. That says a lot. They warn their shareholders, but not the people. I am wondering, uh, it's, it's just the kind of on the back of the question you just asked and Theodora's answer. Um, I've grappled with the fact that our, our school board has sort of a um, an informal role in the expertise surrounding deploying technology in the county. In other words, it doesn't fall under their mission, and um, and yet their facilities people are um essentially recommending to the school board to approve these kind of arrangements and nobody really has the expertise for that kind of thing and i was wondering what your comments would be around that um what i would say kind of inappropriate role in this mm. whole that's a really good point we found out um they, they don't have expertise in it. And in fact, there ended up being uh, in a 
community nearby, like they actually had to hire a staffer to manage the situation. Because when you have a real estate deals like this, so they actually made an office with a person whose job it was to manage the cell tower situation. But who was paying for that? The school was paying, school district was paying for this person to work full time dealing with the land issues that there were. But yeah, they they most people don't know. Like for example, is there a policy on the contractors that come? Like, I mean, there's so many issues here from fire to things falling, like radiation aside, so many issues. Uh, and, you know, there's contractors and then there's contractors of contractors of contractors. Who's checking? You can't walk on a school these days unless you have, you know, fingerprinted and this and that. Is that happening for these workers who are coming on to the school campus? Who's monitoring that? Who's checking? Whose job is it? Is it the teacher's job? Is it the principal's job to do that? Like, that's what started happening here was people, parents were like, hold up. <laughs> like, you know, what in the world is going on? And they come a lot. And then there's the issue of what's your backup power? Is it diesel? Is it gas? What, what is it? Is it a fire hazard? So some of them are considered hazmat sites if they have certain kinds of um, power that they have and the fire uh, department has to be know where those sites are because if there's a fire, you know, and you have a cell tower fire, cell tower fire it's very different than other fires. Um, and they need to know. And then there's also the big battery backup that's sitting there. There are so many issues that the general school, like having worked in a school for years, like we don't know anything about that. Who is checking? Who knows anything about that? So just a follow on question. Don't know if you have any experience around this or not, but one of the other things that has uh, bothered me a little bit is, um, I think it was 2005 or six, we bought this land, the county bought this land for around $10 million. Mm. Um, half the land was used uh, for the present school. And then the other half of the land was likely um, uh, purchased for a future expansion. And it was all done through a bond referendum. In other, in other words, we all paid for this $10 million land. But once they put this tower on this 25 acre plot of land, which is about half the land that they bought, so $5 million worth of land, it pretty much becomes unusable for any other purpose other than for the tower. So it seems to me that that is another egregious misstep in the use of county money that taxpayers paid for just to hand it over to a tower company um, in their future profits. And, and we end up with a thousand dollars a month lease. Um, I was wondering if you've seen anything quite like that. Is that something you've experienced? Absolutely. And right here in our county, 100%. And you're not the only one. And I'll, I'll show you this, or as another example, this tower, what happened was that tower was not so close to the school. But then they redid the school. And what do you know, they had to build around the tower. So here they were with money to expand everything. And then they had this tower and they literally, as you can see, it's very, it wasn't like that before, but that's like another example is so, and I've seen that there's another piece of land um, that we have up north here that's now basically giveaway to the cell tower company. And parents are like, wait, this is school land. You know, did the, does the deed allow that? Who's signing off on that? This, when this happened for us, you know, the first thing is like, get answers, like, you want to see the deeds. You want to know who ha who has the right to sign off and who's making the decisions. Where are the leasing agreements? What do they say? Um, and how did this happen? What's the process? Because generally in the process, you find a lot of moments where, or at least I found where I'm going, wait, what happened here? What, how do, what? because I thought that 
kids and children's education was the primary goal and purpose of this land, of this, of everything we do, not even to mention the time wasted in arguments in cell in school board meetings and the emails and all of that. Who's paying for that? We are, right? We the the whole thing is like it's not a good, it just doesn't put kids at the center. Like, how is this helping the kids? That's always my question is how is this helping the kids? Is it helping the kids? Is one, two, three thousand dollars a month really helping the kids? Because um, and often the companies will say, well, it's this many millions, but actually what they did here is they gave the 30 year plan after 30 years. Yeah, there'd be this, but really it was like, we could just have a farmer's market on there every weekend. That's what we should do. We could have like, we could sell things. We could have the kids sell paintings. We could, we could make more money than that. Mm -hmm. We'll have a fair on the ground or something. I don't know. Just, yeah, we would have put a gas station on a school. Um, there is one question in the chat that I can read, um, which is if a school has a lot of acreage and they could pinpoint a section that children will never use, in your opinion, is there any safe distance or any distance that can be considered safe? I mean, I know that um, you had just, you know, uh, 1600 feet was what, um, was it Kent Chamberlain had recommended? Is there a safe distance? I don't know if I'm going to opine on the safe distance. They often say like at least 1,600 feet to not have that close, the closer level where, where you can see it. So I think what we're really asking for is when it comes to schools and children to really take extra care because the laws that we have were not designed to protect them from long-term exposure. So responsible placement would be, um, not on or near schools. There's another question in the um, chat. Have you found studies comparing local Wi-Fi access points, uh, access point radiation versus cell tower? They said it was brought up several times that our schools have needed to install local on-premise cell coverage repeaters. So I guess it's talking about repeaters. Would that be like boosters for the signal? Because a lot of times in the schools, they have they're brick, right? So inside the school, if you're in the interior of the school, you often can't get a signal. And that maybe that's what's being referred to. Um, yeah, so everything wireless is radio frequency. And what happens with a tower is it's sort of nonstop. It is much lower than when you maybe have a device near your body, but it is a full body. And actually there've been some studies. There was a study that was just published actually, that was looking at using a phone versus a cell tower exposure. And they said, when you actually look over time at the entire, the whole body, and the, they were actually looking at the brain only, they said, in fact, the, that full body that is actually getting you more over time of course, now wireless is everywhere, but actually the, the studies have shown that when you put in a tower or you put in a close proximity facility of some type, that you're going to get a higher level around the area where the uh, anten antennas are. There was a study on Australian kindergartens, and they found that the they actually put a meter on the kid's backpack. So the kids were measuring with this meter that was attached to them in all of these kindergartens. And the schools where the where there was a cell tower uh, within uh, several hundred feet, of course, those kids had much higher exposure than the kindergartners that were into schools that was further away from the antennas. I, I just wanted to actually piggyback on your question from earlier in terms of liability. Has there been, um, as, of, as of yet, has there been a lawsuit brought against any of these companies um, for injury related to cell power, cell power, um, cell tower radiation? Because to me, it's a red flag that if these companies can't get insurance and they're still doing this, it's because that they know that they don't have, they're not at risk, right? Because the burden of proof would be so extreme that, you know, it, it that it wouldn't be harmful for them to, you know, to pursue this. Well, there are lawsuits. Some have been stalled. Some have just begun. 
um, there haven't been, there hasn't yet been a successful lawsuit, but that doesn't mean that there won't be in time. If you look at like plastics or talcum powder, you know, so here, yeah, now there was just a lawsuit that just put forward by a man who lived in an apartment and the cell tower, the, I'm sorry, the cell antennas were put right outside his window. Uh, Elijah, you can sort of look it up, Justice for Elijah, I think it is. And he he didn't know anything about this issue. He just started getting sick. He started getting sick. He didn't know what it was, these terrible headaches, only to sort of get make that connection. There's an antenna literally on the other side of his bedroom wall. And he just launched a uh, injury lawsuit on that. Because so I would assume you would need that large scale class action to really make a dent in this. Yeah, there was a class action. It was related to phones in California and it was moving along. And then um, it got preempted by the federal, the federal rule, the FCC. So the preemption issue is big. So, you know, you were probably, or anyone who asks in a community is told, look, we have these federal laws and we're compliant with those laws. And then, um, that's why we have aimed at the FCC. And we want, you know, we just want what we, oh, I'll just tell you what we want. We want laws where the FCC limits are based on proper study. And so that we know what level is safe, what the numbers are, where's the data to support that. Because the limits that we have are based on these studies where they took uh, rats, a few bunnies, some small monkeys, and they heated them up for less than an hour. And they identified in that less than an hour, the level of heat inside the body. And they said, that's it. That's the bad one. Cause the little animals were pressing a lever for food when they were hungry, uh, they were trained to do so. And then when they stopped pressing the lever, they took the temperature of the animals. They had a, a colonic temperature, they called it. And they said, that's the level of harm and that is literally what our limits are based on. It's not based on long-term exposures or all of these things. So, but that is what our FCC limits are and everything is being preempted. But we believe that there will be a successful challenge because the FCC, uh, we're actually moving forward with other actions related to this because the FCC has not responded to the lawsuit. They haven't responded to the court. They were ordered and they have not done it. It's been two years. There's Thank one you. more question. I'm hoping we could just pack this in and then um, wrap it up. The last question is, uh, what is the alternate alternative safe solution to get internet access in schools? Is hardwiring the only option? Yeah, we, we believe that hard, hardwired is a big piece of it. Uh, oh, one other thing I had a slide on was a Santa Clara Medical Association's best practices, which just came out in February. They recommend distancing towers from schools and hardwiring in schools as, as many experts do. But also, we also want companies to develop safer technology because we will, you know, if you, if we are not doing everything wireless and doing more things with wires, you can really decrease the need for more and more and more. Because what's happening is we need more towers, more network, more, more, more. That's because we need to accommodate everything everyone's doing. But if we did more on the wires uh, and also did what we do a little more judiciously, but maybe that's a lot to ask with TikTok and all these things that kids are doing. But, you know, we don't, do we really need what we're doing? Like, what are we doing with technology? That's a bigger question that I'm sure everyone thinks about who's parent. But, um, but there is ways to design networks in safer ways. You know, we would love to see companies be researching uh, you know, putting their R and D into safer technology. There are so many solutions. Like it does not have to be this way, but the only way to make that happen is for communities and people to have their elected officials to hold the government accountable. Yeah, that's good. Good parting words. Good last advice. <laughs> So I just want to thank you so much, Theodora, for taking time out of your obviously long day, um, making it longer and helping us out and getting us educated. So if anybody's interested in finding more information from the Environmental Health Trust, you can go to ehtrust.org. It's a nonprofit organization. Obviously, they're dependent on um, 
donations, et cetera, but tons of tons of research. And um, Theodore was dropping some great um, PDFs and articles in the chat throughout the entire entirety of this time. So make sure you take a look at that. Um, and also um, I'll put some links in the Facebook group. If you're not a part of the Facebook group, um, then um, you, you won't, you'll miss out on that stuff that I'll be posting in there. So it's Union County uh, residents against 5G towers at our schools. So I'll put some information in that Facebook group. We have a newsletter too, if you want to sign up to learn more. Thank you so much for the opportunity.